Chapter 25, Bleeding and Shock. As we transition from medical into the trauma chapters here, this is where a lot of people really start to gain a lot of interest. You know, the, the concepts of trauma, although always unfortunate for our patients, uh, it offers an exhilarating component to the job. And while there are some people that don't enjoy the sight of blood or anything like that, uh, the complexity of trauma is very challenging, and a lot of people tend to be attracted to that challenge. When we're dealing with trauma, uh, it is arguably one of the more difficult patient issues that we're going to have to run into. Um, although trauma is one of the more interesting and people tend to pay attention the most during these, these discussions, um, we see that test scores historically are the worst in the trauma categories. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that with trauma, it involves multiple systems. Uh, it's not just a, a single presentation or a single issue, uh, especially in the instance of, of you know severe trauma from a car accident, a fall, or something like that. There can be a whole lot of things that are going on uh, inside that affect multiple systems. And because of different types of injuries, the patient's presentations uh, may conflict with what we would expect to see. So what we have to do is have a really good uh, in-depth understanding of the pathophysiology that's going on you know, within the body there understand how each injury is going to present, but how that may also interact with other types of injuries, and also how uh, prior medical conditions, even age and gender, are going to play into those presentations. So again, the, there's certainly a, an incredible level of complexity here, which makes this very difficult. So be sure that you're really kind of diving in deep. Uh, don't look just at the surface content here, but really ask yourself, why does this happen? You know, what what's going on uh, beneath the skin that uh, causes these things to occur, and more importantly, as an EMS provider, how can I actually help the patient to, uh, to survive these injuries? So looking, first of all, at the circulatory system, this is, again, probably the third, maybe the fourth or fifth time that we've talked about the circulatory system and the, the physiology that exists along with it. And the reason being, obviously, is because it is an integral part of life. Anything having to do with the blood, distribution of blood, oxygen, nutrients, removal of waste products like carbon dioxide, you know, that's all stuff that is required to happen 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So it's, it stands to say that we need to have that in-depth understanding of the circulatory system. Um, when it comes to trauma, because trauma is often associated with bleeding, it's even more important. So looking at this here, you'll see that, you know, as blood exits the heart, it travels throughout an arterial system uh, throughout the entire body. And eventually, at certain areas, it's going to whittle its way down to capillaries. Those capillaries are nothing more than a single cell thick, and they allow the exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide, waste products, and everything else to occur at that capillary level. Generally speaking, blood vessels such as arteries and veins should not allow anything to penetrate through those walls. Those walls are relatively solid. So the exchange of gases and nutrients and everything else should only occur at the capillary level, barring some underlying type of illness. So when we think about trauma and we think about shock and how it all kind of plays together, we think of three major components, the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood itself. And if you think about it, the heart itself is a mechanical pump. It takes the blood, it circulates it throughout the entire body, so without that pump working, we have no circulation. More importantly, without that pump working, working at the right speed and with the right force of contraction, we're not able to maintain an adequate blood pressure. And really, that's what we're looking at. With the, uh, the cardiovascular system here, we want to ensure that we're able to maintain an adequate blood pressure that is capable of transporting oxygen and ultimately delivering that oxygen and nutrients to the cells with a high enough pressure to actually perfuse it through those capillary walls. We also look at the blood vessels as the container. So the container, consider a glass of water. If that glass of water is full of water itself, not a problem. But now if I take that glass of water and I dump it into a larger glass, the volume of water is the same, but now the container is much bigger. Whenever this happens, if, if we have widespread vessel dilation, maybe it's from a neurogenic shock issue, maybe it's from a sepsis uh, component, you know, whatever causes these, these blood vessels to dilate, the, the volume of blood remains the same, but now they're in a much larger canister or a much larger container. Therefore, the blood pressure starts to drop. So we have to have not only the heart that pumps effectively at the right speed, 
uh, along with the right force of contractility, but we also need to make sure that the container is the appropriate size and that it doesn't get too big on us. Lastly, we have the blood or the fluid. And now with this, it goes to say that we need to have an adequate amount of blood within the body. And there's a few reasons for that. If we lose blood, of course we lose volume. And as a result of that, now we're losing pressure, right? No matter how small that container gets as the blood vessels try to constrict to, to compensate, no matter how fast the heart pumps and how forcefully it pumps, if there's no fluid left in the system, nothing's going to work. So we look at the loss of blood from a pressure perspective, all right? We lose volume, we lose pressure, therefore we're not able to perfuse the, the oxygen and nutrients out into the cells. But there's another component we have to consider as well. You know, as a paramedic, I can start an IV and infuse what is effectively salt water, right? Sodium chloride. I can infuse that into the patient's body, into their blood vessels, and I can re replace their lost blood volume. But what does that salt water not have that blood does? Well, there's quite a bit. It doesn't have platelets. So therefore, if I am diluting my patient's blood supply with IV solution, all I'm doing is reducing their ability to clot. Additionally, it doesn't have red blood cells. So by again diluting that blood with my IV fluid, now I'm taking away the patient's ability to transport oxygen. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, and that's why we have to understand that, you know, there's, there's so many complexities. I can't simply start an IV, replace fluid, and get the patient's blood pressure back up. Because in doing so, now I'm potentially going to cause the existing bleed to become even worse. What we need to do is look at the big picture. What are the patient's injuries? Where are the patient's injuries? Is it something that I can actually fix? And sometimes, and it actually talks about it in this chapter, the best treatment, the best intervention for your patient is rapid transport. And we need to be able to recognize when a patient's injuries are beyond the scope of what we're able to take care of in the field. Something that, you know, we could spend all day splinting and making it look perfect. But that splint isn't going to fix the internal bleed that the patient has. So we need to be able to, to balance or prioritize rapid transport versus field treatment. We need to be able to quickly identify the different types of injuries and determine where we need to transport to. You know, considering our area, you know, we don't have any level one trauma centers within driving distance. So if you have a patient that's severely injured and they're going to need some pretty significant surgical intervention, especially if it's at night or on a weekend when the, the local hospitals aren't staffed with their surgeons, we need to quickly identify that request that helicopter and get them to that level one trauma center that they need. So again, just a, a review of the different vessels. Uh, arteries carry the oxygen-rich blood, right? As the, the blood is pumped out of the heart, it's pumped through the arteries themselves. They are very thick. They are very strong-walled. They have a lot of muscle within them, and they're capable of, of withstanding quite a bit of pressure. If we hit an artery, if we have an arterial bleed, we're going to expect that to be spurting, and it's going to be bright red blood because of the high oxygen concentration. Capillaries then, those are the smallest. They're typically microscopic, and what those do is they're single-walled vessels that allow the exchange of gases and, and nutrients throughout those walls there. So every artery terminates into a capillary. And then every capillary is the beginning of what's going to end up being a vein. The veins themselves, they have one-way valves so that we don't allow for any backflow of blood. Right? We want to keep the blood moving uh, a single direction, always returning back to the heart in order to be recycled and pushed back out. These are going to be oxygen depleted. So when we have a venous bleed, it's going to be a lot of times a darker red than an arterial bleed would be. And rather than spurting, it's going to be more of a, a gradual ooze um, or, a, or a steady flow. Either one would be a, an appropriate way to describe it. Uh, both venous bleeding and arterial bleeding can be life-threatening, especially depending on the vessels that are impacted. Capillary bleeding typically won't be life-threatening. Uh, they're small enough, those vessels spasm if they're injured, uh, causing some constriction there. The clots are easy to develop because the vessels are so small. So when we see capillary bleeding, we typically associate that with like a, a skin knee, some type of road rash or something else. So we hinted a little bit toward the different functions of blood already. We know that we need them to transport the oxygen, and most importantly, we need, to, uh, need them to pick up the waste or the carbon dioxide product and get rid of that for us. It's going to help us with nutrition as it transports different um, vitamins and nutrients. It's going to help get rid of the, the garbage that's produced as a byproduct. 
It also helps to protect us when we think about uh, getting ill, right? The white blood cell attack and everything else, it's going to help that inflammatory response so that we can begin to fight off illness. And then regulation. Uh, most particularly here, we think of regulation with body temperature, right? The blood is able to transport or, or diffuse heat throughout the entire body. So whenever we lose blood, we also lose our ability to maintain body warmth, which is extremely important, especially when it comes to trauma. So the term perfusion simply means adequate circulation of blood throughout the body. And when we talk about perfusion or shock, we're looking to see, are we adequately perfusing not only the vital organs, the brain, the heart, um, the, the lungs and everything else, but are we able to perfuse all parts of the body, right? All the way down to the most distal areas, uh, down to the fingertips and down to the toes. When we're not able to do that appropriately, we're in a state of hypoperfusion or shock. Now with shock, we're going to talk about the different types, different stages and categories. There's a lot that goes on with shock, but being able to er uh, recognize it early and treat it is going to be really important in order to sustain not only life, but a quality of life for that patient. When we use the word hemorrhage, we're referring to a severe bleed. And that hemorrhage can be both internal or external. When it's external, it's really easy to identify, right? We look at the patient's body. There's a whole lot of blood coming out of it. It's easy to say, hey, they're hemorrhaging. We should probably fix this. What's difficult, though, is the internal hemorrhage. You know, what happens when a blood vessel ruptures inside the body? We can't physically see it. There's two things that really lend a complexity there. One, we can't see it, so it's difficult to identify. And two, even if we do identify it, it's not, not something that we can get to to actually fix it or try to stop that bleeding. So in both situations, you know, we're, we're going to be kind of in the dark there. We're not going to be provided with any information. The patient can't specifically tell us, hey, I'm bleeding inside. So we have to look at signs and symptoms. We have to be a detective and investigate. And we're going to look at signs of hypoperfusion that would clue us into this. So what are their skin parameters? What's their mental status? How are their vitals responding? Are they within that fight or flight or that compensatory response stage? Um, and looking at all these things and kind of putting these pu uh, puzzle pieces together, we should be able to quickly identify the possibility of an internal hemorrhage and be able to rapidly transport to the appropriate facility. So here's an illustration that shows the three different types of bleeding. We mentioned them already, arterial being bright red and spurting typically at the same rate that the heart rate is. Veins, which is going to be a darker red, it's a steady flow of blood. And then capillaries, which we would typically describe as road rash or something else, where it's really just that kind of that very slow ooze. Um, and again, you know, well, let me rephrase this. I, I said earlier the capillary bleeding is probably not going to be generally life-threatening. However, you know, picture a uh, motorcyclist who is thrown from their motorcycle and they've got road rash down the entire backside of their body. Their entire back, their butt, their legs, everything is just covered in road rash. In that situation there, the sheer quantity of bleeding from all those different capillary sites could present a hemorrhage issue, right, where they could be bleeding out. It's most definitely going to present a hypothermia issue because now we're not only losing blood, but now we've scraped off a whole surface area of insulation that helps to maintain body warmth. So that situation there, even with that capillary bleeding, that could potentially be a life threat just based, again, on, on the sheer volume and surface area. So when we talk about external bleeding, it's the type of bleeding that's outside the body, something that we can quickly identify and hopefully something that we can immediately uh, mitigate or fix. There are times though that because there are multiple areas or multiple sources of blood, it makes it difficult. Sometimes we're unable to determine where the blood is coming from, especially if it's up within the head, right? Uh, hair kind of describe or disguises the, the source of the bleed. It hides some of the different lacerations from time to time. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to tell, you know, is blood coming out of the ear or is blood running into the ear? And uh, these are all things that we have to kind of really look at delicately because, you know, bleeding from an ear, that's a pretty substantial finding for us Compo or compared to a, a scalp wound, which, although that could be an issue, uh, is generally not going to be life threatening. So when we're looking at that external bleeding, you know, what's the severity? How much blood are they losing approximately? What type of bleeding is it? Where is it coming from? Can I stop it? So this is, again, just repeat. I think I've already mentioned a handful of times the different characteristics of, of bleeding types. Um, what are some underlying conditions, though, that can accelerate the bleeding? Uh, 
And these are really big. Uh, prescription medications. If a patient is on a prescribed blood thinner, warfarin, Coumadin, um, and there's a whole bunch of other medications out there on the market these days, that really complicates things. You know, what would otherwise be a, a simple wound that we could probably apply a, a light pressure to and, and be done with it uh, could turn into a life threat. With these blood thinners, what it does is it reduces the body's ability to clot. So anytime the body is injured and bleeding starts, and it should start to self-repair itself, these blood thinners actually inhibit that. Now, these blood thinners are prescribed in order to prevent clotting for a purpose, because the patient likely has some type of medical condition where clots would become an issue. But in the instance of trauma, they are our absolute worst enemy. So being able to identify that's going to be really important if we know that a patient, you know, let's say a, an elderly patient tripped on a rug, fell, and hit their head. Um, not the end of the world right? Maybe they didn't lose consciousness. Maybe they have just a, a small laceration on their forehead. We're able to apply some pressure to that and, and put a bandage on it. But what we have to consider is the fact that since they hit their head, if they did rupture a blood vessel within their brain, which is not difficult to do, then that blood thinner could cause what should be just a, a small contusion that would probably go away and fix itself. It could actually cause that to develop into a, a major intracranial bleed. And that's the type of thing where a patient may go to bed with a slight headache and not wake up again the next morning. So we again have to look at what are these medications, what are their underlying medical conditions, and how is that going to impact the trauma, and whether or not we're comfortable, you know, allowing a patient to sign a refusal perhaps, or whether or not they have to be transported to the hospital or even to a level one trauma center. Hypothermia is the other big thing. So when a patient's body temperature is, is, uh, is too low, even by a little bit, if they're hypothermic at all, that really impairs their ability to clot. So with our trauma patients, and especially patients who appear to be in shock, uh, maintaining body warmth is super important. And we're going to talk a lot about when we do trauma assessments that, you know, we're going to probably cut the clothes off the patient so that we can visualize the entire body, quickly identify the presence of these potential injuries. But in doing so, we have to be cognizant that, okay, you know, strip them down so we can see the injuries, but once we're done, we need to cover them back up and really focus on that preservation of body heat. If, if we allow that body temperature to drop, they're going to continue to bleed and bleed and bleed. I'm sure it goes without saying that when we're dealing with any type of bleeding or hemorrhage, we should use the appropriate standard precautions, right? Wearing gloves is a must. Uh, putting glasses on or even a face shield may be appropriate and you know, we have to be prepared that the bleeding could be uh, become a, a hazard for us so take those appropriate precautions use the appropriate uh, PPE so here's a big component that uh, well let's just say it, it we're in kind of a, an odd transition period right now where in the past civilian EMS was very very regimented in the fact that we assessed airway breathing and then circulation it was an ABC procedure and there were no exceptions to that whatsoever however the last 20 years and especially the the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan have taught us a lot about trauma the military advancements in trauma care and preservation have have really given us a lot of insight into what we're doing wrong and how we could do things better and the management of bleeding over airway or breathing is, is one of the big things that they came away with. That listen, we can manage the airway, we can administer all the oxygen in the world, but if the patient is losing catastrophic amounts of blood, none of that really matters. So what we've done is in civilian EMS, we've slowly begun to transition into a more military-minded um, approach to these things where we start to identify these life-threatening hemorrhages and we'll treat them aggressively first. So the next couple slides we'll talk about treating airway breathing circulation first and the reason being is that for exams a lot of exams especially at the the national level have not really fully transitioned into that new military mindset they have not transitioned into that that bleeding first mentality. So as a result, I want you to look at your exam questions and the potential answers and answer them in a chronological order that allows for the management of the airway, then breathing, then circulation. And again, just understand, I'm going to cheat, teach you a couple different things in class, but it's just while we're still within that, that awkward transition period, okay? So if you see this, right, a substantial bleed, 
on the exam, you should still consider assessing the airway first, and then assessing breathing, and then go back to fix the bleed. Real world, probably going to be a little bit different. But for the exams, treat in A, B, C order. Okay? So in reality, we can also do it all at once. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know, we talk about how to ad address things from an exam perspective, but thinking about real world, if I see a life-threatening hemorrhage, is there a reason that I can't drop a knee onto it and apply direct pressure with my knee while I'm still repositioning the patient's airway or applying oxygen? And really, there isn't. So if we can multitask, and, and that's a skill set that you will develop over time, do so. So it says here, control bleeding only after assessing and treating prior elements. And, uh, and that's fine. Um, but again, you know, we know that if we're losing blood, if that blood is gone, we're not going to have a patient to deal with. It doesn't matter how much oxygen I give a patient. If they don't have any blood to transport it, it's not going to make a difference. So how do we manage bleeding when we do find it? Uh, there's several different methods. Uh, direct pressure, elevation. We now have hemostatic agents and tourniquets. And uh, we'll talk about the different applications of those in here. Again, the book has a very procedural approach to this. Uh, I'm going to provide you with a little bit more uh, real-life insight into how to do it. But uh, from an exam perspective, we should consider uh, treatments in the order listed on the slide here. Direct pressure first, elevation second, and then third from there would be a hemostatic agents and or a tourniquet, depending on the location of the injury. So here's an example of direct pressure. Now, never mind the fact that they're not using a glove on their hand, right? That's, that's highly inappropriate. We should have a glove on. Always use appropriate PPE. Um, but otherwise, you'll see that the patient has a hemorrhage from the abdomen there, and they're trying to apply direct pressure. Now, in this situation, depending on where that, that hemorrhage is coming from, right? If this is a superficial laceration that's just on the surface of the skin, this is probably going to work just fine. But if it's a deeper laceration or something from like a stab wound or other penetration, uh, then let's be honest, we're really not applying any pressure to the wound at this point, right? We're applying pressure to the bleed or to the blood that's coming outside of the body, but we're not applying any pressure to the source of the, the bleeding, which is going to be the severed blood vessels. And that's where the pressure needs to go in order to allow the clot uh, formation to begin. So with this patient here, if this is going to be a, a deeper penetration, then I would suggest a hemostatic agent. So when we're applying that direct pressure, in most cases, we need to hold pressure for at least two minutes before any clotting can occur. But in reality, we don't know how long it's going to take. So once we apply direct pressure, we want to try to maintain that pressure. And we can maintain that pressure either by holding it ourselves. We can instruct the patient to hold pressure on their own. We can apply pressure dressings if appropriate. Or we can use some of the other tools that we may have. Um, something to consider when we're doing direct pressure, a lot of times... You know, despite in, in this previous picture here, it just shows, you know, the hand itself. Realistically, we're probably going to apply some, some gauze, right? Some 4x4 four four pads or something underneath our hand. Once we apply a dressing of any sort to a bleeding wound, we don't want to remove that dressing. We want to leave it in place. And the reason is, as clots begin to develop wherever the, the severed blood vessels are at, we want those clots to remain intact. And if those clots come in contact with the dressing, they could actually latch onto the dressing a little bit. And if we were to remove that dressing, now we're also going to rip that clot away as well. So whenever we're using a dressing, we apply pressure, we leave that dressing in place. If bleeding soaks through it, we'll just add additional layers of dressing on top of the first one. But we're never going to take it off. Uh, all right, I think this just kind of recaps what I just said. Elevation. Uh, I'll be quite honest with you. Elevation is completely ineffective and it does not work. However, the book will tell you that if a patient has an injury, that we can actually take it, especially if it's on an extremity, and we can try to elevate it. Now, if any of you have ever donated blood or platelets or anything else, when you're done and they remove the angio from your leg or from your, uh, your arm, they give you a gauze pad, they tell you to hold pressure, and then they tell you to put your arm up in the air. And what you're doing is you're applying direct pressure and you're also elevating the, the injury site. And as long as you don't have any clotting disorders, your uh, blood vessels should clot up relatively quickly there. And, you know, if you hold your arm up there for two or three minutes, that's usually all it takes. Now, they also tell you, though, uh, that after they put that pressure bandage on, right, they put that, that really elastic gauze around you, 
They tell you no strenuous activity, no heavy lifting, no doing anything like that for at least a few hours because if that clot does develop, they don't want it to break away as you're, you're moving the arm around a lot. So really, they're doing trauma control every time you go and, and donate blood. Um, but I can tell you that the, the elevation principle really is ineffective. It's a waste of time. So I, although you, you're welcome to try it, it's not going to hurt anything to elevate the patient's arm. Um, it, because it's so ineffective, uh, I really think that you could probably make better use of your time by either putting on a pressure bandage, applying a tourniquet if necessary, or even just simply initiating rapid transport. Hemostatic agents have been only recently introduced in civilian EMS. You know, if you think back to a lot of those old-time war movies, you know, you think about Saving Private Ryan, and, you know, somebody is injured in that situation, and they pull out this packet, the medic pulls out a packet, rips it open with his teeth, and dumps this powder into the wound. Well, what that is is Quick Clot. That was a hemostatic agent. Now, Quick Clot is just a brand name, okay? Um, but the hemostatic agents themselves, what they do is they go in there, they bind uh, with some of the blood, and they actually increase the clotting uh, efficacy at the source of the bleed itself. So they create clots. They're very, very effective, especially the newer hemostatic agents that we have available now. But instead of just simply dumping a powder into a wound, now the, the powder itself or the hemostatic agent is impregnated into dressings. So we'll open up a package and we'll have this, this thick Z-fold dressing that we can use. And the hemostatic agent is actually it's, it's put inside of this dressing. So as I stuff the wound with the dressing, that hemostatic agent is activated and it'll begin the clotting process. Uh, and here's an example here, right? This one is actually rolled instead of a Z-fold, but most of them are going to be Z-fold. It's going to look more like an accordion, and it allows us to actually pack the wound. We don't wrap a wound. If somebody has a laceration on their arm or leg, we're not going to wrap it with this. These are for deep penetrating injuries, uh, typically within the torso, that we can't get to with direct pressure, in which case we can actually take this, and we will you know, we'll stick two, three fingers into the wound on the abdomen and we'll stuff this entire thing in there. And if there's enough room, if the, the void space is large enough, we'll go and get another package and we'll stuff that in there on top. And what we're trying to do is pack the wound so tightly that it applies outward pressure on the severed vessels. The hemostatic agent activates, begins the clotting process. And then on top of that, once we, we uh, introduce that into the wound, we're going to apply direct pressure over the top of that. So we're really using multiple approaches at trying to get the, the bleeding to stop. Now tourniquets. For the longest time, tourniquets were taboo. If you put a tourniquet on, that meant that somebody's arm was going to fall off and it was catastrophic. Well, again, in fact, and we can thank our military for this, uh, tourniquets are not bad. Tourniquets are actually really good when applied appropriately and removed with an appropriate amount of time. So from an EMS perspective, if we have a significant hemorrhage from either one of the extremities, right, upper or lower extremities, then we can use a tourniquet to try to control it. Now, tourniquets do have some downsides. Although they're effective at stopping the bleed, they are very, very painful when applied appropriately. So if a patient has a simple laceration that we can apply pressure or put a pressure bandage on, that would be our goal. But if it's a life-threatening hemorrhage, or even if they you know, if it's a multi-system trauma and they're hemorrhaging from the several locations, and we just don't have the time to put bandages on or hold direct pressure on all these different uh, wound sites, then we can quickly apply tourniquets as a bleeding control measure while we go and focus on more complex injuries with the patient. So with these tourniquets, when, when you apply it, it'll actually occlude all the blood flow beyond the point of the tourniquet. So that's good from the perspective that it's not bleeding anymore, right? We're stopping that hemorrhage. But since we're blocking blood from going Beyond the tourniquet, we're also blocking blood from returning and going past it back to the body. So we essentially compartmentalize the extremity. And what happens there is we switch into an anaerobic metabolism, uh, which means that we are able to metabolize but without oxygen. And because of that, it's very inefficient and we have a lot of acid as a byproduct of that metabolism. So what's happening is all the tissue in the arm or the leg beyond the point of the extremity is no longer getting oxygenated and as a result switches to anaerobic metabolism and produces all this acid. So now we have this big acid buildup and that's why we never release tourniquets in the field because once that tourniquet is released 
there's a high likelihood that it's going to dump a bunch of acids or a bunch of uh, waste products back into the rest of the body. It can cause cardiac dysrhythmias or attack other organs. So the removal of a tourniquet is only done in the hospital uh, by a physician, and it usually is accompanied by several other medications that help to offset all of those acids. There's multiple uh, brands or manufacturers of tourniquets out there. Uh, this is called a mechanical advantage tourniquet. I'll be honest with you, this thing is never used anywhere. Uh, I don't know of anybody that uses these whatsoever. The most popular one is this one here, the combat application tourniquet. No, I don't have any vested interest in any of these. Uh, I don't sell them, nor do I profit from recommending one. But I can tell you from somebody who has practiced and trained and used these multiple times, this cat tourniquet is definitely the best one out there. And these are the ones that our system provides. Uh, when we go to use the tourniquet, of course, as with anything, we would follow the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, but again, once we put it on, we have to tighten it down until the bleeding stops. And uh, it, it requires a lot of pressure. It requires a lot of strength on our behalf as the EMS provider to tighten it down enough to actually stop the bleeding. Um, so these things are going to be relatively barbaric. They're going to inflict a substantial amount of pain into our patients. Uh, but at the end of the day, we look at this as, you know, the, um, the, the benefits outweigh the negatives here, right? Yes, it hurts, um, but the patient's not going to lose all their blood supply, they're not going to go into shock, and they're not going to die. So controlling external bleeding from a systematic approach um, just means that we need to, you know, begin with the simplest method and progress up. And the simplest method being... A, a direct pressure and then from there we can go into using more advanced concepts such as the tourniquets or even the hemostatic dressings uh, but again we have to look at the the big picture right and I told you earlier if it's most appropriate to start with a tourniquet then that's what you start with if you don't have the time or the resources to, to try direct pressure that's fine I don't want you screwing around on scene for five or ten minutes trying to find the most effective uh, bleeding control method I want you to quickly identify the type of bleed, control it with the best option you can think of, and then move on to the next thing, because our trauma, trauma patients are incredibly time sensitive. You can also try splinting. Uh, splinting really doesn't do much in the way of bleeding control. If you had a broken bone and it was causing some bleeding, by applying some traction or straightening that out or splinting it, it could minimize some of the bleeding but I would strongly against ever looking at splinting itself as a bleeding control measure. Cold application really only works uh, for minor internal bleeds. You know, we'll put a nice pack, obviously, on something that is swelling. And when we think about swelling, that, that is, in, in fact, an internal bleed. That's a rupture of capillaries or even some arterioles or venules uh, within the subcutaneous layers of skin that causes that, that swelling to occur. So because that is a type of internal bleeding, we can apply a cold pack, and uh, cold itself actually causes vasoconstriction. So as those vessels start to spasm down and constrict, uh, we should hopefully allow for the clot development to occur relatively quickly. Now, when we talk about cold application, it's going to be isolated to, to a single injury site, um, something relatively small and insignificant. If my patient is in shock and they're hemorrhaging, under no circumstance should I think about getting out a cold pack. Because in that situation, A, cold pack would be ineffective to stop the bleeding, and B, we want to really protect against the presence of hypothermia. Head injuries are tough. Uh, so head injuries, because they are so incredibly vascular, uh, they bleed and bleed and bleed, and they look like just the worst injury you can possibly imagine. And in those situations, we have to, again, just kind of look at the big picture and say, hey, this is simply a scalp injury. It looks really bad. They're probably not going to die from it. And because the vessels are so close to the surface of the skin, and because we have the bone from the cranium right beneath the skin, it's very easy to apply direct pressure and to stop a scalp wound uh, without much of, in the way of additional intervention. But beyond that, what I want to look at is what caused that wound, and could that cause, could that mechanism of injury have caused a, a rupture of a blood vessel inside the cranium? And that's where the life-threatening injury is going to come into play. So... Uh, not only looking at the, the surface bleeding here, but what was the mechanism and what are some other injuries that can occur. Epistaxis is a nosebleed, and I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have had a nosebleed before. Uh, 
but believe it or not, these could be life-threatening, especially for some of our elderly patients that are on blood thinners. Um, it's very easy for them to develop nosebleeds. I had a guy one time, he called, we, we got called for a nosebleed, and of course, you, know, you kind of roll your eyes a little bit, you're thinking, all right, whatever. Well, we got there, and he's sitting in the bathroom, leaning over the bathroom sink, and there is just linen upon linen upon linen, soaked through with blood. This guy had been bleeding for well over an hour, um, embarrassed to call 911 because of a simple nosebleed, and was trying to just hold pressure and get it to stop on his own, and it wasn't stopping. And I'll tell you what, this guy was approaching a shocky state simply from a nosebleed. So it's certainly a possibility, and we have to approach all bleeding as, as being a potential issue. Uh, but if a patient does have a nosebleed, no different than anything else, we hold direct pressure. And how do we do that? Well, we squeeze the nose. Most ambulances actually carry little nose clamps, little padded clamps that we can put on either side of the nostril, <clears throat> and it pinches the nose closed. Beyond that, then, we want them to lean forward, right? We don't want that blood running backward uh, into the airway. We don't want it running down into the stomach and inducing any type of vomiting. So we in invite them to lean forward, and a lot of times what they'll have to do is keep their mouth open. One, because they're pinching their nose so they can't breathe through it, so therefore they have to breathe through their mouth. But two, as that blood fills up the nasal cavity, it's going to kind of pass into the oropharynx, run along the top of the, the mouth there, and allow it to just drain out of the body. If the patient were to go unconscious or unresponsive, we'd want to turn them onto their side into the recovery position. And of course, if we had to maintain an airway for them or ventilate them if they weren't breathing effectively, um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be super tough because in this situation here, they're bleeding uh, into the posterior pharynx. We need to have them in a supine position in order to bag them effectively. But at the same time, we have this blood that's going to become a, an obstruction. We can't suction and ventilate at the same time, so what could we do? This would be an instance where maybe putting in a, a king tube or an eye gel or some other adjunct like that would help out, right, where it's going to actually block the glottic opening and prevent any of that blood from getting in there. Uh, internal bleeding to other internal organs uh, is always going to be a risk as well, especially when we have uh, injuries to the upper quadrants of the abdomen involving things like the spleen, or the liver, both of which are uh, incredibly vascular and if injured or lacerated in any way can cause substantial internal bleeding. So when we look for internal bleeding signs, we're going to look for things like that rigidity, swelling or distension, a pulsating mass perhaps, uh, lots of different things that we can look at from a physical perspective. But we should also be able to look at a patient um, objectively without actually you know, palpating for specific injuries and say, hey, you know, there's something going on. This patient's in shock there's a good chance they have an internal bleed. So from that perspective, we could identify pale, cool, and clammy skin, uh, weak radial pulses, or maybe even absent radial pulses, altered mental status, or high levels of anxiety. Um, you know, these are all things that we can look at to say, hey, you know, this body is in a compensatory state. Why is that? What's going on that's causing this fight or flight response? Uh, blood trauma is tough because the energy, if you guys uh, think back to physics class, right, um, energy never truly dissipates. It just transfers form. So if I were to hit somebody with a baseball bat, you know, that, that energy within the baseball bat itself, as, as it impacts the body, that energy is transferred into the body. And that energy is not only going to cause injury at the surface of, of the hit, right, with some, some bruising or maybe some swelling where they're hit with the baseball bat, but that energy is also going to transfer into the rest of the body. We could see spinal cord injuries or broken bones. Uh, we could see uh, different internal organs that get ruptured. So there's so many potential consequences from that amount of energy that's transferred into the body. So that's why when we're dealing with trauma, looking at mechanisms of injury is probably one of the best things we can do to really identify what's potentially going on and uh, how, how bad is it going to be. Penetrating trauma. Uh, is equally bad in the sense that obviously we know for a fact that something has gone into the body and probably caused some damage. The only upside here is we kind of have a better idea of where the injuries may be or what types of organs may be involved. You know, in the instance of transferred energy uh, from blunt force trauma, if I were to jump off the roof of a house and land flat-footed on my feet, you know, of course, yes, I'm going to have probably some broken ankles or something like that localized to where I landed. 
but that energy transfer is going to shoot straight up through my body and I'm going to end up with compression fractures in my spine and you know I could have a cervical spine injury all the way up in my neck from a jump where I landed on my feet so looking at that mechanism and understanding the physics of it is going to be super important you know what are some different signs of internal bleeding and we've, we've talked a lot about those. First of all, look at the physiologic signs. You know, what are the skin parameters? Uh, what are their pupils doing? What's their heart rate? Uh, what's the quality of their pulse and respiratory rate? You know, these are all things that we should look at from a fight or flight perspective. Uh, but additionally then, what are some physical findings that would suggest the presence of internal bleeding? We, we've mentioned that already, right? Bruising, swelling, distension, pulsating masses, uh, rigidity, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, let's see here. We've talked a lot about internal bleeding from a trauma perspective, but if you think back to the uh, abdominal emergencies chapter, we also talked about gastrointestinal bleeding. And uh, GI bleeding for, could be a medical issue, but from time to time it can also be caused from trauma. Uh, nonetheless, you know, the presence of blood in the stool or presence of, uh, presence of blood and vomit, you know, both indicate the presence of an internal bleed. <clears throat> You'll see here there's a quite a bit of bruising going on here. So this tells me, hey, you know, there was most likely some type of blunt force trauma that occurred to this patient's shoulder. Now from here, all right, it's easy enough to say, all right, there's bruising, but I want to look deeper. What's what's behind this? What are some risks? Could I have a dislocation of this joint? I could. Are there major blood vessels that run just beneath the clavicle and then run down into their arm? And there are. So there's, is there a chance for bleeding? There could be. If energy hit here and transferred into the body, could there be broken ribs behind here? That's a possibility. You'll see that the patient's in a um, C-collar. That C-collar suggests that, okay, they're looking at mechanism of injury, and they're concerned about the potential for a cervical spine injury. So they, they took that precaution. Just, again, so much going on that we have to look at and really consider. So how do we care for these different patients? Of course, maintain the ABCs. Uh, administer oxygen as necessary, control any external bleeding, and remember, this is the order that they want it done from an exam perspective. In real life, you do what you need to do in the order that it makes the most sense to take care of your patient. Okay, uh, Hypothermia control is important, so we need to keep these patients covered, and then prompt transport to the appropriate facility, uh, including requesting a flight for life or any other type of air medical that you may have available. We're going to skip over this video, it's not very impressive, and we'll roll right into shock or hypoperfusion. So again, shock is just hypoperfusion, right? It is the inability to deliver the oxygen and nutrients to the cells and to remove the waste products, including the carbon dioxide. So whenever that doesn't happen, we can say that we're in a shocky state. And causes of shock are numerous, right? Could be related to trauma, could be related to illness, could be related to anaphylaxis, uh, any number of things. But generally speaking, when we think about shock, we want to look at the three different things that really allow for perfusion to occur. The heart, the blood vessels, and the blood, also known as, again, the pump, the container, and the fluid. You know, when we try to identify the cause of shock, we want to look which one of these things is missing. What isn't working appropriately and why? Can we fix it? You know, the causes of shock, looking at this here, you know, we find this patient looking this way. Why is that? What happened? You know, what is it that led to this point? Um, and we'll start by looking at, okay, you know, what's their mental status? What's the quality of their pulse? You know, do they have a weak pulse? Is it thready? Um, are they altered? Are they anxious? And inside we're thinking, okay, the blood vessels are constricting. Uh, it's going to cause the patient to become pale and clammy. Um, the respiratory rate is going to increase all part of the compensatory response. As the blood is shunted away from the surface of the skin toward the internal organs, uh, they become nauseous uh, because, again, now we're not getting blood to the GI unit or to the GI organs. Uh, their blood pressure will begin to drop. And if it's already dropped, that's going to be a late sign suggesting that they're in a decompensated state. So it's just kind of a, a slow progression here. These are all things that we can evaluate to determine whether or not a patient is in fact in shock. Now there's two different severities. There's compensated and decompensated. 
Uh, irreversible is a third severity, uh, but really it's hard for us to differentiate between decompensated and irreversible shock. Uh, we don't know if a patient hit irreversible shock in the field, so we're going to focus really on compensated versus decompensated. And compensated shock just simply means that the body is able to, in fact, compensate, right? The vasoconstriction, the increase in the heart rate, um, the increase in respiratory rate, all of these things are working effectively to maintain an adequate perfusion pressure or an adequate blood pressure. Now, once all of those compensatory responses um, no longer work, if once they become ineffective and the blood pressure starts to drop, despite all of these things going on, that's when we can say the patient is in a decompensated shock. And that decompensated shock, we typically say that any blood pressure below 90 systolic is a sign of a, a decompensated shock. But I want you to understand that when we're trending, right, if I told you that a patient's blood pressure was 100 over 70, no, that alone isn't enough to say that they're in decompensated shock. However, if we're trending and their blood pressure went from 150 over 90 to 130 over 82, to now all of a sudden it's 100 over 64, you know, that obvious downward trend says that they are decompensating. So the body's response is no longer sufficient. Um, within that, we also have hypovolemic shock. So uh, we talked about compensated and decompensated as far as severity. Now we have all these different types of shock. And if we can identify the type of shock, it may give us an idea as to what caused it and ways that we can fix it. So hypovolemic, if you break down that word, simply means lack of volume. And in this situation here, they could be hypovolemic as a result of hemorrhaging. And if it is a result of a, a bleed or a hemorrhage, we would call that hemorrhagic shock. But somebody can be in hypovolemic shock even without hemorrhaging. You know, somebody such as anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is, while it's its own type of shock, causes a relative hypovolemia. As the body excretes a lot of excess fluids, um, it shunts fluids from certain areas of the body, it dilates the blood vessels, all of those things create this relative hypovolemia. So lots of different things that can fall into that category. Um, we also have cardiogenic shock. So while hypovolemic shock has to do with volume, cardiogenic shock has to do with the pump itself, the heart. So in this situation, the heart is not working effectively. And from a trauma perspective, there's things like pericardial tamponade that could cause a cardiogenic shock. Um, but it could also be something as simple as a heart attack that would cause it. So anytime that the heart stops working effectively and it is not able to pump blood at a, a pressure sufficient to perfuse all of the vital organs, we would say that they're in a cardiogenic shock. We also have neurogenic shock. Now, neurogenic shock, that, uh, that affects the blood vessels themselves and their tone. <laughs> the vascular tone um, in neurogenesis, it cuts off circulation or cuts off communication rather with the brain. So the brain is no longer able to communicate with these blood vessels and as a result, by default, they dilate or they open up. So in hypovolemic shock, we have a volume issue. In cardiogenic shock, we have a pump issue. And in neurogenic shock, we have a container issue where the blood vessels themselves are the problem. Something to keep in mind with infants and children. Uh, they have an incredible efficient, uh, incredibly efficient way of, of compensating. So as a result, they're able to continue to compensate, compensate, compensate until it's just way too late. With adults, we start to see gradual changes and clues in, as to the fact that they are decompensating. With infants and children, though, that's not necessarily the case. A lot of times they'll compensate until the point they just can't do it any longer and they will drop off a cliff. And as a result, we have to look at mechanism of injury. If a child is injured and the mechanism of injury is that is such that it would potentially allow for a, a shock to develop, we have to assume that that patient or that child is already in shock. We should make assumptions of shock strictly based on mechanism of injury for children because they don't display anything until the very tail end. So that means that a patient who is otherwise acting relatively appropriately, uh, especially for a kid, let's say that the kid's crying and, and upset and everything else, that's, that's what would be appropriate, right? I would expect to see that from a kid who is injured. Um, I would not expect to see a kid who is lethargic, limp, um, not responding appropriately, that type of stuff. 
So for a kid who was, for instance, just involved in a car accident, and the kid is, is screaming and crying and, and upset, that's all a good sign to me. But I would look at that good sign, and I'd say, however, although the kid is acting exactly like I would expect them to after an accident, you know, this, this minivan just got hit by a box truck. That's a pretty significant mechanism of injury. This kid could be compensating right now. I could be missing all of the signs of shock because the kid is compensating so well. And as a result, I'm going to get that kid to the appropriate pediatric trauma center as quick as I can, right? Again, strictly looking at mechanism of injury. So the progression of shock is going to start relatively small and move up pretty quickly, depending on the severity of the injury, the bleed, etc. Um, but, you know, when we talk about mental status, it's going to go from a feeling of anxiety at the very beginning. You know, they're, they're nervous, they're, you know, they feel like they can't catch their breath, they're scared, you know, basic feelings of anxiety, and it's going to progress up into semi-consciousness. You know, they're drifting in and out and eventually get down to the point that they're completely unresponsive. Pale, cool, and clammy skin. You know, you'll start with just pale and cool extremities. Eventually, the entire torso is going to catch up. Um, with the vital sign changes, you're going to see the blood pressure remain relatively constant so long as they're compensating, and then you'll see a gradual decline. Meanwhile, you'll see the heart rate continue to increase as it works harder to compensate even more. You'll see the respiratory rate increase as it works harder to compensate. And unfortunately, while I wish I could give you a list of explicit signs and symptoms related to shock, um, the signs and symptoms change a little bit depending on the type of shock. So whether it's cardiogenic or hypovolemic or neurogenic or anything else, there's some subtle changes. So in class, we'll sit down and we'll start breaking down those differences and we'll look at the physiology beneath that and we'll talk about why one shock prevents one way and another shock presents another. So transportation, I mentioned this at the beginning of the discussion, transportation is an intervention. Any time our scene time is greater than 10 minutes, you need to have a damn good reason for why that is, right? These, these patients, these trauma patients, especially because of mechanism, they could have stuff going on internally that we don't see. They need to get to a medical facility that is capable of imaging, right? They can do CT scan and x-ray. They can do MRIs if needed. Um, they have the capability for surgical interventions, you know, we can we can only do so much on, in the field and no matter how complex of a wound care we do at the end of the day big picture it's nothing more than a band-aid so we need to get these patients to the hospital so our scene time goal should be 10 minutes or less if it's more than that it needs to be you know for some out uh, some cause out of your control beyond that again airway breathing circulation treat as necessary and that really brings us to a conclusion. I'm going to show this one last video to wrap it up. It's just a good summary of what shock is and how things work. And then from there, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your night. Shock, or hypoperfusion, is the inability of the circulatory system to supply cells with oxygen. In early stages, symptoms occur as the body attempts to compensate for blood loss. Physiological causes of shock are the heart failing to pump, loss of blood volume, or blood vessels dilating, creating a vascular container capacity that is too great to be filled by available blood. Categories of severity are compensated shock, presents as an increased heart rate, increased respiration, and constriction of peripheral circulation, which results in pale, cool skin, and in infants and children, increased capillary refill time. Decompensated shock starts with low blood volume or lack of perfusion. Symptoms include falling blood pressure. Shock is irreversible when perfusion to the organs cannot be restored. Cell damage occurs, especially in the liver and kidneys. Even if vital signs are restored, irreparably damaged organs may cause death. 